Could this be the remains of one egg that he had found in one particular spot, or were they perhaps pieces that he had gathered from all over the place? There was only one way to find out, to try and piece them together. And the best method of starting seemed to be the same as you use when you begin on a jigsaw puzzle, to lay out everything face up on the ground. Now, would they fit together? These two certainly did. To fasten them temporarily, I used adhesive tape. With a jigsaw, you at least know that all the pieces belong to the same puzzle and that they do go together somehow to form a complete picture. But this was different, much more exciting and tantalizing, for I had no idea how much of the egg was present or whether all these pieces belonged to one egg or to several. With mounting excitement, I managed to get piece after piece to fit together. The egg began to appear even bigger than I had imagined. At the end of an hour, I had two halves. And to my joy, they fitted together perfectly. There were only three or four small holes, and I still had several pieces left over. There was a place for even such a tiny fragment as this. The egg was well nigh perfect. As I held it, I had little difficulty in imagining the country as it must have been only a few hundred years ago when this riverbed was filled with a brown eddying flood and when great numbers of gigantic birds over 10 feet tall strode majestically through the swamps. Most of Madagascar's native trees have been felled and replaced by plantations of eucalyptus imported from Australia. Unfortunately, many of Madagascar's animals can't find the food they require in this new and foreign environment, but even so, the place was not totally barren of animal life. Dead logs, to anyone looking for animals, are fascinating objects. You can never predict what you'll find beneath them. Giant millipedes, perhaps, snakes, or here in Madagascar, as always, something very special. You might think, at first sight, that these small creatures are baby hedgehogs. But they're not babies, for these are fully grown, and neither are they hedgehogs, although they seem to resemble them so closely. They are a strange, extremely primitive creature called a tenrec, and they live nowhere else in the world but in Madagascar. The local people have superstitions and taboos connected with nearly all their animals, and they have them about even such an inoffensive little beast as these. 
Many men, particularly if they reckon themselves to be brave and strong, are unwilling to touch them. The tenrek they regard as a cowardly creature because when danger threatens, it rolls itself into a ball. So it stands to reason, they say, that if they had much to do with it, they too might be infected by cowardice. We made quite a collection of tenrecks of several different species, which we brought back to London. But these two I'm especially fond of, because a month after we'd got them back to the zoo, to our surprise, they gave birth to these babies. Unfortunately, the female was not a good mother and killed several of her young. So it was decided to take the remainder, these two, away from her. It was a difficult decision to make, for you can never be sure how creatures as young as these will take to a substitute diet. The composition of milk varies quite a lot from one kind of animal to another, and as no one, as far as we knew, had ever bred tenrex before, the zoo had no previous experience to work on. Nor had they an analysis of tenrex milk. However, they fed these babies on cow's milk, greatly diluted with water and sweetened with a little sugar, giving it to them to begin with from a pen filler. Fortunately, they took it so successfully that within a few days they had developed enough to be able to lap up milk when it was given to them a few drops at a time from a hypodermic syringe, as they're doing here. When they were first born, their coats were merely furry. But now, after a week, the bristles are already beginning to thicken into a tiny spines. We had to go to their main laboratories in the capital, Tananarive. And there, I was privileged to see one of the most remarkable creatures in the world, the coelacanth. Until 1938, scientists only knew the coelacanth from fossils, and they believed that it had become extinct over 60 million years ago. Then one, alive and snapping, turned up in the trawl of a boat fishing off South Africa. It was a scientific sensation of the century, but infuriatingly, its internal parts had been destroyed. In spite of an intensive search, it was not until 1952 that another was found, in the Comoro Islands, just off the coast of Madagascar. It turned out that the Comoran fishermen caught one or two each year, but they didn't value them highly, their flesh wasn't particularly tasty, they said, and only their huge rough scales were useful, excellent for rubbing down the inner tubes of bicycles before mending a puncture. But to the scientists, the coelacanth was of paramount interest, for it seems certain that fish, very like it, were the creatures from which the whole of the amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and indeed man himself, are ultimately descended. Every detail of its anatomy, therefore, is of absorbing interest. Its fins have long, fleshy lobes at their base, which make them quite unlike the fins of any other living fish. And there seems little doubt that these represent the first rudimentary legs, which enabled the ancestral amphibians to drag themselves from the water and begin the colonization of the dry land a process that the recently evolved little mud skippers are now repeating all over again on their own account. Furthermore, when scientists examined the internal organs of this strange creature, they discovered that it had the beginnings of an air-breathing lung. If any animal in the world deserves the much-used expression living fossil, it's surely this. This was different, yet it must be the voice of the Indus, it could be nothing else. They were replying to their recorded song with alarm calls. But where were they? There, 40 yards away, farther than I'd guessed, judging from the loudness of their calls, and 30 feet up in the tree. How close would they let me approach?
They were big creatures, even larger than I'd imagined, at least three feet tall, and the tinny voice of the recorder seemed to hold them fascinated. The proportions of their body with their very long legs were strangely human and I remembered once again Marco Polo's dog-headed men. But then either the strange quality of their recorded singing or else my presence became too much for them and they were off jumping magnificently with their bodies upright in a manner quite unlike that of monkeys. we were in the territory where brown lemurs live. They are becoming increasingly rare and the Madagascan government has passed laws making it illegal for them to be caught. But in the middle of the forest, we came across this trap. The poachers had made the clearing and stretched these poles across it. They knew that the lemurs hate coming down to the ground and will certainly prefer to cross the clearing by running along the poles. When they do, they will enter this noose and there hang until they are slaughtered and eaten. There they were. They were the size of small cats, with dark brown faces and lighter brown fur. And they showed their anxiety with their strange, gruff cries. Though they have hands and feet like those of a monkey, the way they ran through the trees reminded me not of a monkey at all, but of some quite different creature, like perhaps a martin. Their tails are not prehensile, but they seemed to use them as a help in keeping their balance. And they also wagged them when they were annoyed or excited. And here is a female with a young baby clinging to her back and having a pretty rough ride. Brown lemurs nearly always produce only a single baby, very rarely twins, and never three or more. And you can quite see why. There just wouldn't be room.
There was a whole troop of them crossing through the trees above our heads. We followed them and soon discovered where they were going, to a mango tree for their afternoon feed. But in that position, I didn't see how the baby would get anything to eat at all. Although most of them were feasting on the yellow, juicy mangoes, some were eating other things as well. This one was stripping bark from a young branch. And this one had found the nest of wild bees and was stealing the honey. But all lemurs are not brown, and this is the most handsome and strikingly coloured species of all, the magnificent ruffed lemur, nearly four feet long, now, sadly, increasingly rare. I know of no certain explanation for this startling black and white colouring, so like that of a giant panda. However, whereas the drab brown lemur is active during the day, this rough lemur is mostly nocturnal, and many animals that only come out at night are coloured black and white, like the badger or the skunk, perhaps so that they can readily see and recognise one another when it's dark. Actually, the colouring of this creature is very variable. The markings are not always the same shape, and sometimes the patches that are white in this one are, in others, a handsome reddish gold. The lemurs with their fox-like faces and their human-like hands and feet belong to the group of primates, the group which contains monkeys, apes and man himself. But the lemurs are more primitive than any of these other families and appeared much earlier in geological history. In fact, millions of years ago, there were many more types of lemur than there are found today, including a monster that was almost the size of a donkey, which since it presumably had a long furry tail, must have been a really strange beast. But of all the surviving species, this is, I think, the most handsome.